I got it, but I couldn't. I, couldn't I think it's his brother. Is it his brother? Oh, my. I mean, Timmy? Yeah. 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 We were trying to talk to these girls. Sure looks blurred. Yeah. 
she's trying to take it right. You bet. <laughs> I didn't get one of them. Good job, boys. There she is. Hi, Vic. <laughs> you cheat, Vic. See that shadow right there? That's me. That's another hand right there. I don't know who that was. should go both games. If it don't, I'm taking it back tomorrow. They get it? getting hard on my back, Rick.
said you're supposed to charge it 14 or 20 hours before use, and I didn't do that. And I charged it up the other day. I didn't think you had to. Yeah, I'm going to 
to the crowd. Larry Sorensen will be pitching to him. Nobody on and nobody out. The pitch. Fastball is high, ball one. One ball, no strikes. Each man, Cobb had 4,191, so does Rose. Here it is. High ball two. Two balls, no strikes. The crowd booing Sorensen. Two balls, no strikes. The plate umpire, Dave Pallone, Apparently there's a light on a camera or something, Harry, that Pallone wants to shut off. Two balls, no strikes. It's got to be tough for Sorensen to get the ball over in this situation, but he's got to be more nervous than Pete. Now ready. Here's the pitch. Strike for all the fastball. And Pete was taking it. Two balls and a strike. His team is one run behind. This could be it. Here it is. Woo! Had a good rip. And he fouled it back. And it's even up at two and two. Boy, that pitch was right there. He just fouled it. This crowd is all with him. Two balls. Two strikes. Listen to him. Here it is. Ground ball right to the shortstop. Benston has it. The first way he could get the sacrifice and he could still break it in Cincinnati. And, he, and I'll bet you that's what he's going to do, too. I'd like to see Chris Fire play right in front of him so he couldn't get the bunt down. He has always said the game is more important. The victory. Here's the stretch. He's going to bunt, takes it high, ball one. One ball, no strikes. Milner, after failing to sacrifice, single the center to drive in the run. Here comes Spire in again. Smitty had a tough time yesterday. Just as tough today. is far road. He was going to swing the pitches outside. Boy, you got you got to give it to him. Two balls, no strikes. Score tied. Runners at first and second. The pitch. Strike call over the inside corner. Two balls and a strike. Dave Parker on deck. Venable, the runner at second base. Milner at first. Two balls and a strike. High pop foul out of play. He let it all go. He was going for it. Two and two the count. There's young Petey. He's more nervous than his father. Listen to this crowd. We're not in Cincinnati. We're in Chicago. Two balls. Two strikes. The pitch to Rose. with an amazing 4,191 hits. We now take you live to the biggest party baseball has seen in quite some time, Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati, where Pete Rose at 8.02 Eastern Time took an Eric Schau pitch into left center field for hit number 4,192. And there is Pete Rose at the age of 44, finally ending this 23-year search of Ty Cobb's record.
We now take you back just a few minutes ago. Eric Shaw, the pitcher for the San Diego Padres. It is the first inning, and there is no score. And watch it happen. Pete Rose's mom, his family, Mark Shot, the owner of the Cincinnati Reds. And there it is, 40. 192 for Pete Rose. And now once again live just the way Pete wanted it, a very short celebration. The owner of the team, Mark Schott, coming out. Eric Shaw now, of course, a big part of history as well. But now Pete wants the game to go on. He did not want a long celebration in Cincinnati. But the crowd just won't let this game move along. They want to cherish the moment. Pete Rose has finally passed Ty Cobb. This ABC Sports special report is being brought to you by Budweiser. A look at Ty Cobb's last surviving son in a moment. A very, very interesting comment from Ty Cobb. Well, I've always had an admiration for any ball player that really went out there and hustled and hit and fielded. I, I wouldn't care if he was a gorilla. I'd like it. <laughs> Just so he had that spot. Yeah, I think baseball is that, to hustle, to do the best you can. You're only in there a short time. And uh, I think that inspires the fans, people, to, uh, for the love of baseball. I really think so. I think that's the spark, is the real effort that you put into it. The words of Ty Cobb in 1955. We thought all those of you who feel that hot dogs only taste good in the ballpark and that the three best words in the English language are going, going, gone should see the party at Riverfront Stadium. I'm Al Troutwig in New York, wishing I was in Cincinnati. Good night. Space flight history. 75 seconds into what had been a routine launch, a tremendous explosion as Challenger flew at 2,000 miles an hour, 10 miles up, 18 miles off the Florida coast. A slow motion replay indicates a possible problem with one of two peel-off rocket boosters, then a blast that shattered the shuttle's huge external fuel tank and the shuttle spacecraft with it. Aboard, astronauts Dr. And Atlanta's Dominique Wilkins knew that defending the title he won last year would not be easy. You know it's tough to, to repeat, but I'm going to try to come out here and do the best I can, try to perfect most of my dunks, and hopefully I win again. Along with Dominique was his younger brother, Gerald, and that posed a problem for one interested fan. Who would she root for? Both of them. Both of them. I, I don't care who wins. I just want them to do good. It doesn't matter. I'm rooting for both of them. But Dallas fans had no problem picking out their favorite slam dunker, little Spud Webb. The shortest player, and is he really 5'7"? He had the crowd on his side, and it was sure to influence the five judges. They were Sat Sanders, Roger Staubach, Kazzy Russell, Martina Navratilova, and Dave Cowens. And little Spud wasted no time in impressing. Spud moved into the semifinals along with Terrence Stansbury, Dominique, and Gerald Wilkins. First, Gerald Wilkins missed his dunk. Then Stansbury had a case of nerves. But Dominique made his. And then Spud came up with maybe his best dunk of the day. Watch this. And he and Dominique moved into the finals. Then Spud with two perfect scores of 50 won the competition. The little man up against the giant.
business do you have winning the slam dunk competition anyway? Well, my business of uh, going out and competing, and you know, you go out to win, and that's what uh, my objective was to go out and do my best and try to win. Believe it or not, little Spud Webb is the slam dunk king. I'll tell you, it's fun to Kevin Bailey, only a ninth grader at an Indiana high school. Some are saying he's the hottest prospect out of Hoosier land since Larry Bird. Bird's been marvelous. How's that? <laughs> wow. Larry Bird is just one example of why basketball has always been king in Indiana. So it's not surprising that all through the state, there are players hoping to be the next great star. Damon Bailey is a 6'2 guard who has bird-like ability. Larry Bird, I think he's one of the greatest there is. I, I like, really like to play pro ball. I mean, I know it's going to take a lot of work, and there's not very many people that do that, but I'm going to work as hard as I can and try to. Already touted by Bobby Knight as a can't-miss, Bailey admits it would be a dream to someday play for the fiery coach. Yeah, I do. I, I, I think Mr. Knight's a good coach, and I think he's one of the best in the country. But for now, Bailey must be content wearing his high school blue and red. He's a, a very good player, but uh, we're not going to say much about Damon because hopefully he'll be in cream and crimson in three years. You know, if it all goes according to plan, you'll see Damon Bailey in college come 1990, and he should be in his prime in the NBA sometime around the start of the 21st century. You've been watching the College Basketball Report. We'll send you back to Durham after this message and a word from your local station. City. We're now ready to announce the 64 team field for the 1987 men's basketball tournament. The riot road to the Final Four does begin here today in Kansas City. And hello again, everybody. I'm Tim Brandt. And for the third year in a row, the NCAA tournament is a 64 team field, which means there will be no first round buys. Of the 64 teams, there is a little bit of a switch this year. Instead of 29 automatic bids for conference champions, this year there are only 28. The reason for that, Memphis State won the Metro Conference Championship. Now, Metro or Memphis State, rather, is on probation, cannot participate in the tournament. So, consequently, we had 36 at-large bids. The primary objective of the selection committee, they try to make it as balanced as possible in all four regions. There are four geographic regions. Now, before we go to the board, let us show you the four top seeds in the country. In the east, the Tar Heels of North Carolina. Dean Smith has done it again. In the southeast, the Hoyas of Georgetown, which won the Big East Tournament today. In the Midwest, the Hoosers of Indiana. And in the West, the Running Rebels of UNLV. So now we're all set, and I'm going to go through this very slowly so those of you at home can write it down and see where the team of your choice is playing and which bracket. Now, right now, we'll start in the East, in Charlotte, North Carolina. These games are Thursday and Friday, March 12th and 14th. The Tar Heels of North Carolina, which won the tournament in 1982. The last time the tournament was held in New Orleans, it was the Tar Heels against Georgetown. And what a game it was. The biggest crowd ever to watch this game. Dean Smith was masterful. It came down to this. Freddie Brown of Georgetown gave it up to James Worthy. Dean Smith had the title by a point. North Carolina will be going against Penn, which is 13 and 13. Tom Snyder's team, two tournament teams in the last three years with a combined record of 25 and 31. Navy, the middies, reached the final eight last year. Michigan coming off a big win against Purdue. Notre Dame, eight straight wins. Digger Phelps has them rolling 22 and 7. They'll go against Middle Tennessee State. TCU, the regular season SWC champ, 23 and 6 record there against the thundering herd of Marshall, the Southern Conference champion. In Syracuse at the Carrier Dome, these games will be played Friday and Sunday, March 13th and 15th. Florida, congratulations to Norm Sloan. First time the University of Florida has been in the NCAA tournament. NC State, Jim Valvano, what a year he had. He beat North Carolina, finally came back, and he's in the tournament with a 1914 record. Purdue, the fifth straight NCAA appearance for the Boilermakers against Northeastern. West Virginia, out of the Atlantic 10 with a 23-7 and record, go against the Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky. Syracuse, playing at home with a 26-6 and record, will go against Georgia Southern. In the Southeast, in Atlanta, at the Omni, March 13th and 15th, these games will be played Friday and Sunday. Georgetown, the winner of the Big East Tournament, the number one seed, will go against Bucknell. In the southeast, Kentucky, surprisingly high seed with an 18-10 record, goes against Ohio State. 
Kansas, led by Danny Manning, goes against Washington. If Washington should win the Pac-10 today, if not, it will be Houston. Right now, the score in that game, UCLA leads it 61-53. They're in the second half. Nine minutes remain. Clemson, out of the Atlantic Coast Conference, will go against Southwest Missouri State from the Mid-Continent Conference. Now, in Birmingham at the Civic Center, these games will be played Thursday and Saturday, March 12th and 14th. Providence, first appearance since 1978. Alabama-Birmingham, the winner of the Sun Belt, is the 11th seed. Illinois, out of the Big Ten, gets the number three seed and will play Austin P. First time for Austin P. since 1974. In the Southeast, congratulations to the Privateers. A marvelous season. Their first trip, Division I, to the NCAA. Will play BYU. Alabama gets the number two seed, the sixth straight appearance for Alabama, and they will go against North Carolina A&T, which beat Howard. So there you have it. Now we are halfway through the process, and we'll be back to look at the Midwest and the West right after these messages. The road to the Final Four begins here, but before we go on to the Midwest, let's just go back one step. Syracuse at the Carrier Dome in the Friday game will be playing Georgia Southern. We said Georgia Southern. It was not correct on the board. It is Syracuse, the second seed, going against Georgia Southern, which is the 15th seed in the East, playing at the Carrier Dome. That game will be played on Friday. All right. Now, the second half of the seeds. Now, let's go out to the Midwest, and that's where we'll pick it up. They'll be played at Indianapolis at the Hoosier Dome, Thursday and Saturday, March 12th and 14th. Indiana, the Big Ten champions. Now, keep in mind, Indiana last year got in first round against Cleveland State, the Cinderella team, and lost it, 83-79. They will go against Fairfield out of the Metro Atlantic Conference. Auburn out of the SEC will play San Diego, the number nine seed. Duke, last year's finalist, the runner-up out of the Atlantic Coast Conference, lost early in the Atlantic Coast Conference tournament, goes against Texas A&M, upset winner in the Southwest Conference tournament. In the Midwest, as we carry on, Missouri is in. What a job Norm Stewart has done in the Big Eight. And he goes against Xavier, the 13th seed. At Rosemont, Illinois, Friday and Sunday, March 13th and 15th, St. John's, the Redmen, go against Wichita State. I think Eddie Fogler should be Rookie of the Year. 23 wins after his team at Wichita State only had a 500 season last year. Number three, DePaul, goes against Louisiana Tech, the 14th seed. DePaul playing in Rosemont, Illinois, the home team. Georgia Tech, out of the Atlantic Coast Conference, with a 16-12 and 12 record, is in and goes against LSU. Dale Brown, a marvelous job in that tournament. Temple, 31-3, and 3, out of the Atlantic Conference. The Atlantic 10 champs go against Southern. So, we have now taken you through three of the seeds, three of the, the regions, and there have been a few surprises. Obviously, the big story thus far has to be some of the teams playing at home, like Syracuse playing at the Carrier Dome, DePaul playing at Rosemont. Now, let's go to the West. These games will be in Salt Lake City, the Special Events Center, Thursday and Saturday, March 12th and 14th. The running Rebels of UNLV reached the Final Four in 1977. Go against Idaho State. Now, the last time Idaho State made the tournament was in 1977. UNLV beat them in the West Regional Final. Georgia, another SEC team, comes in against Kansas State. Now, Kansas State, many thought, sitting on the bubble, but now is in as the number nine seed. The Cavaliers of Virginia took North Carolina the other night two overtimes before finally losing the fifth seed, going against Wyoming, the WAC champs. UCLA, the first appearance since 1983 for UCLA. Now, this is a team with a storied past. They have not been in since 83. However, it was John Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood, who took them to 10 national championships. He had the talent, Lou Alcindor for one. And what about Bill Walton, the big guy? This year, it's Reggie Miller. How far can he take the Bruins of UCLA? UCLA will go against Central Michigan. Now, in Tucson, Arizona, these games will be played the 13th and the 15th of March, Friday and Sunday games. The sixth seed, the Sooners of Oklahoma. And they'll be going against Tulsa, so it is an all-Oklahoma battle. In the West, the third seed is Pitt, going against Marist. Two Eastern teams, Marist from Poughkeepsie, New York. The seventh seed, University of Texas El Paso, going against 
Arizona, which is playing at home in Tucson. And Iowa, the number two seed out of the Big Ten, going against Santa Clara, the West Coast Athletic Conference champions. So there you have it, the 64 teams for the 1987 NCAA men's tournament. Now, when we come back, we will look at some of the conferences and how many teams they put into this tournament. And we will also talk to Dick Schultz, who is the chairman How's it coming? It's almost there. We can wait till morning. No. Mother will be back in the morning. Father we are away, it'll be a lot better. Got to feed the dog. Normandy, northern France. The common rituals of life here along the English Channel have lasted unchanged through centuries. Seigneur, nous te prions, que deviennent pour nous le corps et le sang de Jésus, le Christ, notre Seigneur, au moment d'être livré et d'entrer librement dans sa passion. Markers were left here by prehistoric peoples. This church was erected 900 years ago. Now under construction a mile away. A monolith of the nuclear age. The world's largest nuclear fuel reprocessing plant. Handling spent fuel from France and seven other nations. Here, plutonium and uranium are extracted from spent fuel rods for further use. The process leaves highly radioactive liquid waste. 
It is mixed into glass and encased in stainless steel, eventually to be buried deep underground. The French take all low-level waste, encase it in steel or concrete, and bury it just below ground, so it can be moved if necessary. Au niveau de la réussite technique, I think that as far as technical success is concerned, I can say without too much immodesty that our engineers and technicians know what they are doing. Therefore, it is not unusual that other countries want to come to France and make use of our expertise rather than developing their own with all the accompanying problems. While the French are taking the lead in trying to find a solution to waste containment, the U.S. is still groping for solutions. With many failures in both high and low level waste disposal. One of the more spectacular failures here at West Valley, New York, involving commercial attempts to reprocess spent fuel. One company pulled out, leaving tons of waste so dangerous it can only be handled by robots. The Department of Energy is now cleaning it up at a cost to taxpayers of half a billion dollars. In other failures, three of the nation's six low-level waste dumps have been shut down during the last decade because of poor management, poor siting, or both. In fact, we still haven't figured out what to do with the uranium wastes from the manufacture of the Hiroshima bomb in a silo at an old explosives factory in upstate New York are thousands of tons of radioactive residues dumped there 40 years ago. They are presently being pumped from the silo to a temporary landfill until the DOE comes up with an answer. America gave the world nuclear technology, but in coping with its wastes, we seriously lag behind countries like France. The problem began in the innocent optimisms of the 50s. This was an era where so many extraordinary things had been accomplished in science and technology that what was ungracefully called the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle was quite ignored. If there was a failure of foresight about nuclear waste, there has equally been a failure of leadership. Not until 1978 did a president, Jimmy Carter, call for a comprehensive nuclear waste plan not until the early 1980s did Congress pass the two acts that comprise current policy. Since that time, many states have passed laws to prevent themselves from becoming nuclear dumping grounds. The subsequent federal state battles have shown the political problems of nuclear waste to be as intractable as the technological ones. Legislators with short political lives struggle to manage a problem with implications stretching to eternity. We've not yet resolved the question of nuclear wastes. We've begun to explore five or six uh, possible locations for burying this waste deep under the earth in different parts of our country. But of course, uh, people within those states object very strongly and, and the general public is also aroused to join in with that objection. Deaf Smith County, Texas, one of five sites chosen by the federal government as a potential burial site for spent fuel and high-level waste under the 1982 Nuclear Waste Act. But no one wants it. And the state has veto rights over the choice of site that are difficult to override. You see federal government versus state government versus local government. In this instance, the governor has taken a very strong stand and said in very colorful Texas language, before one citizen of Smith Count, deaf Smith County will glow in the dark, sparks will fly. There are parallel political problems gathering in low-level waste management. At present, there are only three low-level nuclear waste dumps in the nation, in Washington, Nevada, and South Carolina. 
the 1980 Low Level Waste Act called for additional regional dumps to be set up through interstate compacts and ratified by Congress by the end of this year. But not one compact has been ratified. In retaliation against the big waste generating states in the Northeast, New South Carolina law allows the governor to close the state's burial ground to outsiders on January 1st of next year. The answer to their problem has always in the past, well, let's just don't do anything about it and keep dumping on South Carolina. And, and that day has come to a conclusion. Fairness doesn't seem to be paying off. Good sense uh, resolve of tough national issues uh, doesn't seem to be the way this country wants to go. Uh, we have a difficult time in this country dealing with tough issues. As the political debate intensifies over the siting of nuclear dumps that must be monitored for tens of generations, there grows a scientific debate over the burial of any nuclear waste and the risk to our Earth. You always have the problem that uh, you don't really know what happens over very long times. There are ways you can try to extrapolate. Geology, at this point, really is not a predictive science. I would say that the uncertainties related to technical difficulties are so small that I would be perfectly content today to sequester waste permanently in any number of different geologic depositories. But in this debate, it's state officials who must finally decide. Many of them have deep misgivings. What we really have is a is a system that uh, is attempting to engineer into place uh, a technology, the science of which simply doesn't exist or is only now being developed and understood. And of course, the nuclear waste system has to last something like, depending on who you believe, somewhere between a thousand and a quarter of a million years. Yet with no certainty we can ever seal it that long, nuclear waste continues to collect over the world. The best authorities argue for time, more caution, a more intense scientific and financial commitment. Until that happens, we could be leaving the Earth's inhabitants a legacy of danger that will reach to the innocent far beyond our time, to the very edge of eternity. Sanctifie ses offrandes en répandant sur elle ton esprit. Our ability to control them is increasingly in question. On both sides of this great divide, leaders who have believed in security through strength and stability through the mutual ability to destroy each other are now expressing greater fear that these weapons could actually be used. And these fears have been compounded by the possibility of the arms race extending to space. Our end drifts nearer. The moon lifts, radiant with terror. The state is a diver under a glass bell. A father's no shield for his child. One atomic bomb destroyed Hiroshima. Today, over 50,000 nuclear weapons threaten to destroy the Earth. In the United States, 1,000 ICBMs with 2,100 warheads, 325 bombers with 3,500 nuclear weapons. At sea, aircraft carriers and subs carrying more than 5,000 warheads. In Great Britain and France, 1,000 nuclear weapons. In Western and Eastern Europe, thousands of shorter range nuclear weapons. In the Soviet Union, 
over 6,000 nuclear warheads on 1,400 ICBMs, 290 bombers with nuclear bombs and missiles, subs with 2,600 nuclear warheads. In the Far East, Soviet and Chinese weapons aimed at each other. There are enough nuclear weapons to kill every human being on Earth. And the build up to these numbers of weapons is just to ask for it. If you can destroy 100 of your adversary's largest cities, isn't that enough? If you can destroy his industry, isn't that enough? If you can destroy his leadership, isn't that enough? It is absurd. It won't make any difference. It won't have any meaning whether a country is communist or, or capitalist. All the presently known civilization will be dead. For 40 years, the Soviet Union and the United States have talked about the need to control the bomb. But our arsenals kept growing, and our sense of security diminished. Our security rests entirely on the goodwill of the other side. Our final protection has been the cold understanding that neither society could survive a nuclear war. It is called mutual assured destruction a strategy based on a possibility beyond our comprehension. A hundred million or a billion sudden human deaths are kind of abstraction. We don't have, we don't have a language that we can use to, to think about this kind of, of a future, much less the right words to use in talking about it. The blindly expanding arms race constitutes our most tragic failure to comprehend Einstein's warning. Despite the awesome new force we unleashed into history, our old pre-nuclear patterns of thinking have endured. Both sides have remained captured in national suspicions, both failing to recognize that in a nuclear world, armed might may no longer ensure security, that superiority could be a fatal illusion. The terror we've created has purchased a kind of 40-year peace, but on terms we've never faced before, the threat of our extermination. Now provoked in part by a presidential proposal which could extend the arms race into space, there is emerging a fundamental reconsideration of those old mentalities long driving the arms race. But the great question is, are we still so imprisoned in ancient reflexes and fears that we cannot stop the drift toward our own destruction? Among the deepest of fears, that in spite of the awesome power of retaliation on both sides, one side or the other might be tempted to launch a nuclear attack. The arms race is based essentially on fear, and very much irrational fear. A fear, for example, of a first strike from the other side. Irrational or not, the dread of a surprise attack is among the obsessions that have propelled the arms race. And this led to a constant escalation in production and deployment of weapons on our side. And of course, because there's action and reaction, they reacted by expanding their production. That cycle of threats began just after World War II. The United States, alarmed by communist expansion, began to build an atomic stockpile. The Soviets, feeling menaced by America's atomic monopoly, built their own atomic bombs. The United States then built the H-bomb. One year later, the Soviets followed. So we became locked in this age's apocalyptic ceremony. 
the answer to one nuclear threat becoming the new threat to be answered. In the early 1980s, there emerged a new and unsettling possibility. After trailing the U.S. for 30 years, it appeared that the Soviets might finally achieve nuclear superiority. The perception that the Soviets had taken the lead dominated the thinking of the Reagan administration, led to an increase in U.S. defense spending, to a determined effort to regain U.S. superiority. But the CIA would conclude that reports of the Soviet buildup had been overstated. The Soviets had only achieved a rough balance of nuclear might. Even though you could make a case that they have more megatonnage than we have, that somehow they're ahead. But I think in a realistic sense, they're about even. In 40 years, these weapons have grown in total from zero to 50,000. It's insane, and it's very, very dangerous. Now the power of nuclear arms has brought us to a point where the ancient concept of superiority may no longer have any meaning. I don't think you can gain meaningful superiority from a military standpoint. And if one can kill 150 million people and the other one 100 million people, somebody could say one is ahead of the other, but it doesn't, isn't all that meaningful. One cannot achieve supremacy. We can no longer achieve it because the Soviet Union is a formidable and a determined foe. It is prepared to invest whatever resources are necessary in maintaining a, an attack capability against America's cities. That is what they regard as their basic requirement for their own security. I believe we must remain strong. I don't think we can achieve nuclear superiority. I think the attempt to do so brings instability. It brings danger, it brings risk, risk which I am unwilling to accept. By the spring of 1983, President Reagan had to confront what presidents before him had discovered, that no matter how much we spent, no matter how many more weapons we built, we never seemed able to reach absolute security. There was a time when we depended on coastal forts and artillery batteries because with the weaponry of that day, any attack would have had to come by sea. Well, this is a different world. To break out of the nuclear deadlock, the president would call for the most ambitious weapon system in human history. A vast defensive system that's come to be known as Star Wars. The president's plan would produce a bitter division. Will the defense initiative free us from the fatal terms of the arms race? Or unhinge the delicate nuclear balance, carrying us even closer to the annihilating war. Next, Star Wars. With the offensive arms race spiraling out of control, with the arms control effort stalled, the president began to consider a radical shift in America's traditional nuclear strategy. Our only purpose is to search for ways to reduce the danger of nuclear war. My fellow Americans, tonight we're launching an effort which holds the promise of changing the course of human history. To move away from our reliance on mutual assured destruction, the president would consider a long discounted strategy a defensive system against nuclear attack. And I think the logical consequence would be that we would have two armed camps, armed with shields primarily, and not with swords. 
And I think shields are just very much less dangerous than swords. Nationwide defensive systems were outlawed by treaty in 1972. They were considered destabilizing, likely to set off an increase in offensive and defensive weapons, increasing the chances of war. But the cause of defensive weapons was never abandoned by a small group of scientists, congressional and military leaders. They believed defensive weapons could recapture American supremacy, would reduce the need for arms control. I had wished for a defense for a long time, but in the last few years, having real hope that it will work, I argued for it much more vigorously. Edward Teller father of the H-bomb has tirelessly campaigned for new weapon systems. At a private meeting with the president, Teller spoke of advanced laser technology, technology he believed could be used to build defensive weapons. Now Teller found a president who shared his strategic views and his faith in American weapon technology. The Star Wars program was the result of a very small group of advisors with special access selling pet ideas under unusual uh, circumstances directly to the president. In March of 1983, without consulting the broad scientific or defense community, Ronald Reagan launched Star Wars. I call upon the scientific community, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. The president's call for a defense system would prove to be one of the most controversial decisions of the arms race. The president's proposal was startling to move beyond the suicidal terms of mutual assured destruction by erecting a defensive fortress in space. Many Americans weary of living in the shadow of possible nuclear attack responded to the idea, but others fear Star Wars is an unworkable and dangerous delusion that while the proposal seems visionary, it repeats a 40-year pattern that has entrapped every president, liberal and conservative. Failing to break through the deepest political tensions propelling the arms race, each has sought a technological deliverance from a threat created by earlier technologies, has sought security in new scientific advantage. Here, an artist's projection of the president's vision. Banning into space, a layered defense to protect the country from nuclear devastation. U.S. spy satellites would watch the world below, detect Soviet missiles blasting off, compute the position and speed of each missile, alert battle stations in space on Earth. The first response, space-based kinetic energy weapons fire high-speed projectiles from hypervelocity guns intercepting enemy missiles as they are boosted through the atmosphere. Popped up into space, Earth-based nuclear-powered X-ray lasers fire their radioactive rays. Attack rays from land-based excimer lasers are redirected by huge mirrors orbiting in space. Chemical lasers fire beams that burn through the shell of the onrushing missile. Particle beam weapons with pulsing rays join the attack. Still over the atmosphere, the missile bus ejects its cargo. Multiple nuclear warheads. As the remaining Soviet missiles now arc towards the US, ground-based projectiles are volleyed into space. Their giant steel ribs shatter the enemy weapons. The final minute. The surviving warheads enter the atmosphere above the United States, are attacked by laser-equipped planes. Earth-based lasers and ABM rockets eliminate the last warheads. 
the administration's original claim for the strategic defense initiative was that it would be a perfect defense. The president's whole motive here is to try to remove the fear of just threats of retaliation by developing a system of defensive uh, work that will um, uh, ensure that no missiles could get through. But almost immediately, critics said there could never be a perfect defense of our cities, that the president's vision was a dream. I'm a great believer in our technology, and I think our country can just about do anything. But first, I don't believe that we can get to a point where we can have such a defense capability that if the Soviets go after cities, that they can't destroy our cities. That doesn't mean I'm against proceeding with some research. Everybody would be delighted if President Reagan could be proved right. Unfortunately, the laws of physics are not that way. Star Wars would be the single most complicated and expensive system ever devised by man. Its maze of computer programs, the most complex ever attempted, could never really be tested except in war. The whole discussion.